This is the part I both love and hate. I know what I paid for this on eBay, and now I'm about to find out what I actually got. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Today we are continuing the theme of cleaning up and repairing used surface grinder tooling. And this week, I've got a real treat, at least for me, a set of motorized grinding centers. Specifically, this is a set of Atco Moto centers that I found on eBay, and surprise, surprise, the seller was local. I met him at a grocery store parking lot to exchange legal tender for vintage steel, and today we're gonna do a little rehabilitation and see what I actually got for my YouTube dollars. This case has definitely seen better days. The top is cracked and warped a little bit here, but it does have this nice Atco logo wood burned into it. And I would like to keep that. So I don't really want to redo the box, but looking inside, there is some paperwork. This was a pleasant surprise. I didn't expect this though. It does look to be mostly marketing literature. So this is a set of dead centers with a motor for spinning apart on it for grinding. But one thing I learned from this is you can actually put a number one punch grinder on the base plate and it'll line up with the tailstock. I actually have a number one punch grinder actually from Herrig, but they're the same tool and it actually fits. I had no idea that was even a thing. The rest of this appears to be just marketing for the other precision tools they make or made. And so of course this is a shopping list. I have to collect them all or maybe I don't, but I, I kind of do. There is a book in here that seems to be mostly sign plate related. And of course I don't have an Atco sign plate. There is some information on the punch mate and how to set angles. That will be useful because like I said, I do have the Herrig version of the punch grinder. And again, lots of other tools that I need to acquire. It does still have the warranty registration card. So I guess we could register it. And then there's another brochure in here. This looks to be completely unrelated. I don't know if this was marketing material that actually came with the grinder centers or if it's just something that ended up in this box over the years. There's a bag of loose accessories in here and it includes a quality assurance card. That's great though. We really don't have any idea if that came from this tool. Let me get the centers out of the way. We will spend some time digging into this in a minute, but for now I just want to look at the box. It does have nice box joints on the corners. It does seem to be mostly intact except for that crack in the top. The hinges look good. This is really strange on the bottom though. There are these anchors for the shipping bolts to hold the centers in and somebody moved two of them over. And indeed the original holes don't line up with holes in the base plate. So they needed to do this, but I don't know why. I don't know if this box was from a different tool. I really don't know. So there's a belt here in the accessory bag. It looks to be in pretty good shape. This is just an O-ring, of course. And these are the shipping anchor blocks. Screws go through these to hold it down in the case, just to keep it from rattling around to the box during shipping. And these are the screws that were actually used for those shipping locks. There should have been four of them. I only see two of them in here. And honestly, I'm not sure what the rest of this hardware is. This is all fine thread, which nothing on this tool is fine thread. I, I really don't have any idea. This is probably just random fixturing stuff. That is a screw. I did notice there was a screw missing from the guard. And this, I think, might have been something that a previous owner tried to set up as a cord strain relief, but it definitely didn't come with it. If it did, let me know down in the comments if you've ever seen one of those, but I think that's custom that a previous owner made for this unit. Yeah, all this stuff is just gonna go away. I don't even think I'm gonna put it in my hardware boxes. Turning our attention to the centers themselves now, the first thing I notice is this power cord. This does look like a high quality power cord. This looks like rubber to me. It doesn't look like it's a PVC, but this also doesn't look like this was the original power cord for the unit. For one thing, there's nothing for this strain relief to connect into, and the wiring in here is a little on the gnarly side. I think maybe this little bracket was something that somebody bent to go around this replacement power cord and then anchor onto one of the motor studs. I don't know. The color looks right, but I don't think this was original. If you know different, tell me about that down in the comments. The tag here says it was manufactured by Atco Precision Tool Incorporated and the model is hand stamped Moto Centers. And that's just put on adhesively. Let's take the tailstock off here. It's just a T-nut in an angled T-slot here. 
And it looks like the bolt here is just a carriage bolt that somebody's ground flats onto. Let me know down in the comments if that's original. If you have one of these, I would have thought it would be something more refined, but I mean, this gets the job done. So maybe that was original. The tailstock a support itself looks to be in pretty good shape. The underside is ground nice and smooth, and there's a plate here on the end that registers on the side of the base plate. The center is just held on with one screw, and this is reversible. It has a cone center on one end and a cup center on the other, so you can grind things like lathe centers that have tailstock centers that have points. There is a screw and a flexure here for adjusting the height of the tailstock. This is, of course, pretty dirty, and it looks like we are missing a screw on this edge plate. We'll deal with that later. The center here on the motor end is the same thing. It's just got a single screw and it's reversible with a cup on one end and a point on the other, but this has the drive assembly on it. The center itself is a dead center for maximum precision, but this plate spins around that to drive the work and it's just running on a bearing and that bearing is super notchy. That needs to be replaced. I don't think it really affects the function of the centers, but we're gonna replace it anyway. Now the center is spring loaded on this mechanism here and that's to account for growth of the work due to heat uh, but also so you can get the, the part in and out repeatedly and there's a little screw on the back here that's connected to a spring that changes the spring tension. Let me open this up and show you how this works internally. This is just a cavity in here that has been precision ground and then the lid has been precision ground for the fit on the top and everything just fits in here with as close to zero clearance as possible. This is an incredibly tight fit and if you get this together with a single piece of grit under the lid or down in there, it will not move. It will lock up solid. You can see some passages there for oil and there is nothing in here to adjust the fit. This is precision ground to fit. So if this ends up undersize or if the slot's oversize, I don't think there's any recovery. There's a spring in here and it looks like just a little push rivet in the back just to give the screw something to bear on. And then there's a little lever on the bottom that pulls it back against that spring pressure to release it. It's a very, very simple mechanism, just very precisely made. Now, when I put this back together, I had to fiddle with it for quite a while to get it to move freely with all the screws tight. Again, you get a single piece of grid in there and it will not move at all. So the headstock assembly goes on exactly the same way as the tailstock, just with another carriage bolt. And then this gets us down to the base plate. So this is precision ground. All of the precision alignment comes from the dimensions and the grind and the accuracy of this plate. I'll bring out my precision ground flat stones and we'll just dress this down and make sure we don't have any little burrs or anything sticking up. Most of this feels pretty good. With these stones, you can feel anything that sticks up. It doesn't remove any material from the flat surfaces, but anything that sticks up will get knocked down. And on the bottom here, over here on the right, there are a couple of little dings. And after going around this a few times, you can see those have been cut down flush with the surface. So that would have damaged the surface of the chuck on the surface grinder when we put this on, or it would have uh, affected the accuracy, or at least hung it up so you couldn't move it smoothly. I run a tap through all these holes. These are 5 16 18 holes in the top, and they're there just to mount the uh, punch grinder if you want to use that option. Back on the tailstock support again, there is quite a bit of grit on here that looks like caked on grinding dust, but I could not get any of it off, even with a, a steel brush. So I guess we'll leave it. Again, stoning all of the flat surfaces before we put this back together. And then I found a, another screw to put in there to, so that we have both screws. Again, it doesn't really matter. Headstock is the same way there. You can get a better view of the lever mechanism. This one doesn't have a detachable end plate. So I'll just use the square edge on the precision ground stone to get that stone smooth. And then we'll go to the motor assembly. Start by taking off this guard. And that guard was missing one screw. And you can see this wiring is janky. I sure hope this isn't the way it was done stock, but yeah, 
that's not great. Now I did try powering this on so I know that the motor works. It worked exactly once. The second time I turned it on, it blew the breaker and that's because of this wiring disaster in here. We will take care of that though. The motor does feel nice and smooth though, so I think we are in good shape there. The bearing in the drive plate is just held on to the head center here with a couple of these little clips, though it does look like I'm going to need an arbor press to actually get that out. This is just my little one ton Harbor Freight Arbor Press and I'm going to press the center out of this and I'm using little aluminum blocks to press on it just so I don't damage the center. It should be pretty hard steel, but I want to make sure I don't damage it. And that part looks nice and clean. I don't see any galling on it. I think we're good there. Now we just need to press the bearing out. And I don't care about damage to the bearing. I just grabbed a hunk of steel. This was one of the early demonstration pieces for the electronic lead screw project. It happened to be sitting in my scrap bin. And it was just what I needed to press out the bearing. And yeah, it's pretty notchy. The bearing size here is R6, and these are rubber shielded bearings or rubber sealed bearings. These ones have nice blue seals. You definitely want a sealed bearing in this application just because of the exposure to grinding dust and coolant. Uh, a shielded bearing will not last long. Now the bearing is actually thicker than the plate, so it doesn't go all the way through, but that is nice and smooth. I was getting ready to press this in and then realized, yeah, I didn't need to press that in. It just went right in. Put the clip on and that bearing replacement is done. And that is so much better. Nice. Before I put this back together, I want to design a back cover with a proper strain relief for the power cord and protection for the wiring. And I'm going to do that here in Fusion 360. I'll start by just saying insert canvas and I'm going to insert a photograph that I took of the grinding centers. And I'm going to use this as a guide for modeling a cover. So once I have that in there, I need to scale it to the correct size. So I'll right click on the canvas, click calibrate, and then I can click two points on the photo and then enter the known dimension between those points. And I just measured that on the actual unit. This then gives me a photo that is accurately scaled that I can use as a guide for drawing my design and modeling. This is not as precise as using a 3D scan, but since we're just going to be 3D printing this, we can always kind of guess and check. We can get close just by looking at the photo and designing to it, and then we can print it out, see how it fits, make minor adjustments, and go from there. So I can just sketch out the shape that I want this back cover to be. And since I'm working from the photo, I know that I'm going to be pretty close here. Now for the actual design, I use two photos. I've got the photo of the back and I've got a second photo taken from the top. And I've just scaled both of these and lined them up on the planes. And then I came in and sketched out what I wanted. So I've sketched out a back cover here with vent holes that'll match up with the motor and a plate off to the side to provide some protection for the electronics. And I've come in here and this is a mix of following the photo and then entering actual dimensions. Some of the dimensions are things that I measured off of the actual unit. And some of them are just dimensions that I put in here so that I can adjust them later as needed. So using that sketch, I can just do an extrude and create a back plate that will fit on the back of the unit. And this should fit on those studs because I designed it to the photo. And then I can put another sketch here on the top and do some extrudes from that to create more geometry that'll fit and cover up all the gaps on the back of the grinding centers. So this is the basic structure. And then I'll just add a block here with a notch in it for the power cord. I can then put some slots through this for zip ties. So I can just use zip ties to hold the power cord on. Those are just curved slots extruded through there. We'll add a little rib and some bevels for support. Add some fillets to make this all nice and smooth to prevent stress risers, make it nice to handle, make it look nice. And then complete the rest of the geometry. I did put a little bit of a raised edge around the outside. And that's just because the back of the motor isn't flat. It has these rivets that stick out and I want the cover to fit on and bear around that outside edge so that it's not rocking on those rivet heads. 
I printed the part out in black polycarbonate on the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon. This is the first time I've worked with at least the black polycarbonate material and I'm, I'm pretty impressed. It requires a high temperature hot end and a pretty high bed temperature, but the results are excellent. The print's nice and clean. The, uh, the surface is good. The stuff is really shiny and it's kind of slick like ABS, but more so. But this stuff is really hard and really rigid. I think I like this better than nylon, even the carbon filled variants. I did make several runs at this. These are some of the early prototypes. These are just printed in PLA, you know, click the button, get a part in an hour, and then take it out and try to fit it. And I made some mistakes when I took the measurements and, uh, and scaled the photos. So the first one was the wrong size completely. I figured that out. Some of the holes were in the wrong places, but that's the beautiful thing about 3D printing is you can print a part really quickly and easily, do a test fit. If it's not perfect, you make a minor adjustment, hit the button, go do something else for an hour, come back and try again. And I am really happy with the result. We're gonna start the reassembly with the motor unit and we're gonna start with this cover. Now this piece of sheet metal does not fit the curve here very well, but it is really, really hard, really stiff material. The only way I could find to reshape it was just by clamping it in place. And this actually worked okay. Got the curve stretched out a little bit so it fits a little bit better and it allowed me to get the screws in. It's not perfect, it never was, it never will be. Didn't want to go to the trouble of trying to hammer form it because I didn't want to damage the tag that's on it. We'll start by cutting the ends off of the wires and stripping them back. I am going to put a piece of heat shrink tubing over the power cord because we won't be able to get that on later. And I'm going to use a proper ring terminal for the ground rather than just putting a piece of twisted copper under the screw head. For the electrical connections, I am going to use these heat shrink covered uh, butt connectors and then shrink those on. I'm just using a little embossing. This is a rubber stamp embossing heat gun, but it works great for heat shrink tubing. A little piece of heat shrink here on the end of the power cord, and then it takes quite a bit of heat to shrink these, but they have some adhesive in them, and so they seal down nice and tight on the wires. Yes, I am aware that these were intended for automotive use. The listing on Amazon says that they are usable for household wiring. I don't know how much you want to trust that. Feel free to jump down in the comments and tell me what a horrible mistake it is to use this for 110 volt AC wiring. I am going to do a mega test on this when I'm done just to make sure the insulation is good. So I'm not worried about it. And the obligatory YouTube friendly masking tape test on the motor reveals that it's actually turning. And it's turning the correct direction to get the right feed into the grinder on my particular machine. So I think that is going to be fine. Not that the direction really matters that much, but it does to people down in the comments for sure. So here is the beautiful polycarbonate cover that I made. And there's always this moment of panic when it doesn't seem to go onto the screw studs easily, but yeah, that fits really well. The angles all match. There's some little gaps, but that's just because of imperfections in the way the base unit is manufactured. Like that curve doesn't fit around the motor. But that angle looks good. The clearance is consistent. I am really happy with that. Put in a couple of zip ties here. These just push through the channels. Because they're curved, it automatically returns the wire up so I don't have to fish around for it. Just put those through, cinch them down, and I actually do have a zip tie gun. If you do a lot of zip ties, like for building wiring, I highly recommend one of these. It just pulls the zip tie tight, and then once it's tight enough, cuts it off, and they are just invaluable if you, if you handle a lot of these. I will put one more zip tie here on the wiring just to tame it, and that is so, so much better than it was when I got it. I'm pretty happy with that. By the way, the model for this back cover will be on Patreon if you want to download it and print one for your unit. Continuing with the reassembly, we'll attach the headstock to the motor unit, and it's just put on here with these three screws. Now, there is a little bit of adjustment under these screws, and I had to move it slightly to make sure that it cleared this edge. I tested with a precision ground stone just to make sure there was really clearance there, and there really is, so we're good there. And it looks like where the cable landed is great as well. That is out of the way. It's not hitting anything. Everything is covered up. You can't get your fingers in there. 
I really like the way that cover ended up fitting. I mean, it took me a couple of tries. Now this screw was supposed to be a knob. I thought about making one and then realized I have a 3D printer. So I just modeled up a knob in Fusion 360, printed it out in polycarbonate, and I'll just take this over to the Arbor Press and press in the screw. And presto, we have a knob with almost zero effort. And that is a lot better. That is a lot nicer than just grabbing that screw head and turning it. Put in our carriage bolt, put this back on the base plate, and that's pretty nice. That moves nice and smooth compared to the, the gritty feel that it had when I got it. Do the same thing on the tailstock. And again, if you know if there was something other than carriage bolts in these originally, let me know about that down in the comments. I'd be very interested to see what it originally looked like, though I am starting to suspect they just used carriage bolts as an expedient. Put the head center on here too with that beautiful smooth bearing. And we'll move the tailstock up here and see how they align. Now this isn't a, you know, a really precise test, but that looks pretty good to eye. So this isn't like the wrong tailstock from some other unit. I bought some new O-rings. These are 242 size. I think they're actually just a little bit tight. I think something more like a 244 might be better, but uh, you know, your mileage may vary. I did find a place I could buy an official replacement belt, but they're like $20. And so, yeah, I'm just going to stick with O-rings. There are two steps on this pulley in the back for two different speeds. I've got it on the highest speed here, and that's running nice and smooth and quiet. Do need to move the pulley on the shaft to get it to align properly. There's just a little set screw here. And it turns out this pulley is jammed. I spent a bunch of time trying to get this free with a couple of pairs of pliers and working this back and forth and I ultimately had to use a puller to get this off and then the last little bit with a pair of Knipex pliers so I wouldn't damage the shaft and a screwdriver. Ran a reamer through the pulley and then cleaned up the burrs on the shaft with the precision ground stones and a little bit of scotch bright. and after doing that it just went on nice and smooth. Tighten it down where I want it with the set screw and now we can run it on the small pulley. Pretty nice. Now the tailstock has a hole in it to mount a wheel dresser just for convenience while you're grinding. It just fits into the hole here. This is a quarter inch diameter dresser I picked up on McMaster car for a few bucks and it just mounts with a set screw. If you're watching closely, you can see that this wrench is not quite fitting into that set screw. And Jason, if you're watching and I don't know why you would be, I love the Allen wrench holder here, but these Bondus wrenches that come with it are oversize. This is a 3 8 inch and this dimension is about right, but this is 376 and a half. That is definitely oversized. This is 376. These really should be under 375 to fit properly in a fastener. These things are just endlessly frustrating because about half the time I can't get them in the screws at all. Okay, rant done about the tools. This looks really good. This cleaned up nice and I think we're about ready to test. I have a cylinder square here. This is just an inexpensive import cylinder square. I know it's not quite perfect. And a set of centers like this is the perfect tool for regrinding it. This does have centers in the end, but I need to clean them out first. And I'm just going to use a flexible eraser. This is a great way to get grit and gunk out of small centers like this. You just press it in and pull it out and anything that's in there sticks to the eraser. You can see some of the discoloration there. That's just grit and gunk that I'm pulling out of these. Now to lubricate these, because these are dead centers, I'm using extreme pressure lube number three. And I am aware that there are some homemade concoctions. I know Robin Renzetti has shown one that use some different compounds that are no longer used in commercial lubricants, but that you can mix up at home that are far superior to this, or at least enhance its performance. But I get this mounted on the centers and these are so small it's hard to get them in there. And then I'm going to tighten the tension down as much as I can. This is a pretty heavy part. Of course it's not going to spin at all until we link it to the drive plate. I made a little screw here that will fit through the drive plate and extend into the one hole that is in the end of this square so it'll push it around. There's no real drive dog needed for this application. 
And if I turn that on, that spins nice and clean. So you can imagine putting this whole thing on the surface grinder mag chuck and running a grinding wheel across that to grind it. But for today, I'm just going to use this as a set of inspection centers, and we're going to see how far off this thing is. This is a tenths indicator. This is my little interrapid. And we'll get that zeroed as best we can. That's maybe reading about a tenth high. Get that back down around zero, and then we'll check the other end. Now, the other end here looks to be about a half a thou low. So I'll just grab a wrench, put it in this flexure adjustment screw, and we'll dial that back up to zero. And there's zero on that end and zero or close to it on this end. So we are pretty close. Now, when you're actually grinding, you would check the diameter and adjust after grinding. Now that's interesting. That was a zero, but we're not anywhere even close to zero now. And it turns out it's because the, the spring tension is not sufficient for the weight of this cylinder. You can see if I put a finger on that and press it in, we're running up close to zero. And it'll kind of stay there if I keep a little bit of pressure on it. So we've got, what, about three tenths total run out there from the center. So that could be an error in the center, but I assume this was originally ground from the center, so I'm not sure how exactly it's that far off. But we've got about the same amount of error up here at the headstock end as we do at the tailstock. So there's our three thou, or three, excuse me, three ten thousandths of an inch. In the center, we're running just about the same. So it hasn't slipped again, but I'm not sure I trust this much weight in this. Working our way down, it looks like we're at about the same three tenths. And yeah, so we've got about that same error all the way down. So the centers on both ends are out, or maybe the thing is actually out of round. That would require some more inspection. But this gives you a good idea of what you can do with one of these. Now, of course, you would put this in the grinder, spin it, and actually shave that off. But fixing up a cylinder square like this is going to be another video. We don't have time to do that today. I do, however, want to fix this box, though, because these press-in nuts on the bottom are sticking out and they scratch up every surface that I set this box on. They scratch my painted shelves, they scratch my nice white bench top. So I'll just pry these out with a screwdriver and try to drill these in with a Forstner bit. Now, I started out trying to do this with the hand drill. I don't recommend this. It does not really work. But I thought, well, it's quick and easy. I can just try it. But uh, yeah. No, it just will not stay centered. So I took it over to the mill and just punched those in and just pressed them down enough that the bottom of this insert will be below flush with the bottom of the box so that it won't scratch anything I set the box on. Now, I'm putting these back in the original holes, but given the condition of this wood, I do not want to risk hammering on these. So I'll just draw them in with a stack of washers and a screw. So hopefully these washers will spread the load out over the entire surface where those teeth are and I'll just run these down until they bottom. And this ended up working great. I still don't know why the holes don't line up, but they definitely don't. Those original holes do not line up with the holes in the base plate. These are now below the surface and the little marring there that I did when I tried to hand drill it will not be visible because the box will be the other side up. A couple of the felt pads here in the bottom of the box have come loose. I'll just go ahead and stick those back down with a little bit of CA glue. Uh, I don't know if this is the best solution to this problem, but it will definitely solve it. There's just a couple of them here. The other ones are still stuck pretty well, and those will be held down when I put the centers in here. So 
no clamping required. And if they outgas a little bit of white on the bottom, I know I can take it off with a razor blade or with acetone. So not worried about that. Check the fit of the shipping blocks and those sit on there nice. And I've got a couple of two inch quarter 20 screws with washers here. There is a little bit of interference there with the power cord. I don't know if I could move the location of that slot slightly. It doesn't really matter, it still fits okay. We'll get these all in and cinch down and that should now be secure in the box. So if it gets turned over upside down, things don't bang around in here. Of course, wanna check the bottom and make sure that the screws are the right length and that they're not sticking out. And that looks like that's just about right. For reference, those are two inch quarter 20 screws with a single washer under each and that fit really well. I'll go ahead and put the hardware in here. I won't, I won't screw it down just for normal storage. So I've got just the hardware for this unit. Go ahead and put the paperwork back in there, tuck the cord in. I need to go find a cable tie for that and that should be good. I didn't get any video of it, but I did pull out a Mager and test the insulation in the motor windings and of course in my wiring. I believe the threshold we're looking for is one mega ohm in a motor of this type at a thousand volts. And you can see we're getting almost three gig ohms. So the windings in the motor are good. Those cleaned up nice. And I'm especially pleased that the center heights lined up and right in the middle of the adjustment range too. It would of course be possible to fix it if they didn't, but I'm glad to not have to do that. I will need to make some drive dogs to actually grind anything, but I don't think it's worth making a bunch in advance. I'll just make what I need when I need it. And to be honest, 3D printing will work fine for that. As always, the models for the back cover and the knob are on Patreon. Patrons can download files for all of my projects and it's a great way to support the channel. So is subscribing and leaving a comment. Thank you for watching.